In this video, I interview a veteran contractor. We talk about things like uh, replacing oil furnaces with heat pumps or replacing furnaces with heat pumps, heat pump comfort, humidification, and a host of other things that people encounter. He is an East Coast contractor, and if you'd like to see the full interview, uh, we'll make sure to link that at the end of this video for your enjoyment. Hope you enjoy. And for customers that are looking to save money, does the heat pump, when, when does that make the most sense kind of in your region? Because you guys have a lot of oil systems out there too still in parts. Is that correct? Or We do. We do. And and oil is becoming more and more uh, scarce to find contractors to work on it. It's an older kind of technology to heat homes. Really necessary in your more northern regions where it can get very, very cold and you need higher heat outputs. So for our area, converting from oil to a heat pump system is a smart idea. Now, to get the comparative nature of comfort, we would want to go with an inverter-driven heat pump system. And, and that's a system that provides variable capacity. It's efficiency and the way that it operates, it pulls more heat out from outside. And like I said, it can actually provide close to gas furnace-like temperatures coming out of your vents, which again, that's just so different than what heat pumps have been generally and what people are used to when it comes to heat pumps. For sure. Yeah, I know a lot of I mean, one of the things we talk about on our channel a lot is the myth of, uh, you know, heat pumps not working in cold climates. It's like it's gotten my heat pump will work and it gets into negative 15 at our house sometimes when we'll get like a cold snap. And um, granted, we do have, you know, a backup boiler, but it's uh, the heat pump runs it stays comfortable. And so I know things have definitely changed and that's not 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 so much the case. And as far as just touching again on um, savings, because you're talking about your carbon footprint, one of the things a lot of people ask about, and, and there is some truth to this when you really dive into it, is that if you just switch to a heat pump, but you're not cognizant of like where your electricity is coming from, there can actually be either, you know, it can be a wash almost because even though you're electrifying at your hook, you're ba you know, electrifying at your home, the source of heating, you're really just outsourcing your emissions to the plant. If it's like at a coal fired plant or something like that, do you guys do um, or deal with systems? Do, are people putting in solar out there? Is it a good climate for solar or what do, what do people typically do? Actually, yeah, there's and uh, DC in Maryland in particular have, you know, government assistance or subsidies to get those systems in as well, or to put solar in in particular. So you can put solar in, store it in a battery in home, and then utilize that to actually feed the energy to your heat pump system, car chargers, whatever, whatever you've got in the home. Cool. Yeah. Right on. And then, um, as far as it, like your opinion on that, cause I know I've heard, like, I've heard that said, but do you think that's, um, there's some validity to that or is it most i mean do you think do you think that's just people that are maybe naysayers or don't i mean some people i talk to they just like they hate heat pumps no matter what you tell them sort of thing and they just like no just put in a good old gas furnace it's like that's fine we'll put in what you want no worries. yeah but yeah, yeah. I've, i have found with heat pump systems that if you get people who have had heat pumps in their home before and they have the older kind particularly using r22 regular freon as we know it for the refrigerant it's known to be very drafty. You're going to have lower temperatures coming out of the vents. It runs all the time. There's air constantly moving. So it's pulling heat off your body a lot faster. Those are typically the naysayers. Um, now, in terms of the validity to outsourcing your carbon footprint, I mean, in some areas that can be the case. Our area does have some coal-fired plants nearby um, that, that help to generate that. But we've also got some water plants as well. And the water plants are the ones where you're just using moving water to generate a lot of that electricity. So you're really not outsourcing at that point. Cool. And then a uh, uh, interesting question kind of on that same note, and I don't know if you don't know the answer to that, that's fine. But we have something out here where on your bill, you can actually specify the type of electricity where you can actually say, hey, I'll pay an extra. I think it's like only like one or two cents a kilowatt hour. And you can actually buy, you know, green off the grid. So basically they have, what that means is they have for your consumption, they have to allocate a certain purchase from clean sources. Do they have something similar out there with some of the utilities or? You know, not, not in our region that's being okay. advertised openly. No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I was just, I was just curious. Sorry. I know that's kind of out of the left field, but um, <laughs> yeah. figured I'd, uh, I figured I'd ask. So kind of um, segueing off of what uh, you were talking about with heat pumps, you mentioned, you know, sometimes like the older style heat pumps, people felt drafty in their house or they're not getting the same temperature at the vents. One thing we explained to customers is we've talked about how humidification can actually make you feel warmer when you have because you have uh, more moisture in the air. So from and I know your company is called IAQ Medics. So I assume you do quite a bit of IAQ products. You guys do uh, humidifiers out there, correct? Yeah, we definitely get involved in humidifiers, all different applications. 
Okay. And then as far as like steam versus bypass or powered, are you guys mostly sticking with steam or what are you guys recommending? You know, it's, I'll tell you that I definitely lean towards steam myself. Uh, I have a steam in my house. I talk about it with a lot of my clients and for the larger cubic volume homes, it's really what's needed. And I find that a lot of my competitors tend to shy away because they are worried about the price point and how our public might actually perceive that price point. But really what it boils down to is when you have a home that has significant square footage that could equate to a large number of cubic volume based on ceiling height, um, you're going to need to have a steam in there. Now, if we're talking about a row home or a townhome that you could use an evaporative humidifier and be just fine with that, especially with some of the newer products that are available now where they're significantly reducing the water consumption on that, you can uh, humidify pretty well. But steam has the ability to put up to 35 gallons a day directly into the air. And uh, to your point, Moisture retains heat. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. And that's how you feel real cozy and warm in your home is by having a good working humidifier. And the steam is going to be the one that's going to outperform evaporative humidifiers 10 to 1 easily. Cool. Right on. Yeah, no, we have kind of the same experience out here for people that are, you know, serious about humidity or if they, especially if they have like wood floors, guitars, uh, musical instruments. We get a lot of people with pianos that are like, can you get our humidity to 41.6? I learned that number from the piano people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. about that. And I was like, oh, I, I guess we can. But out here, we actually have to run it at about 35. Otherwise, you get moisture on the windows. Um, yeah. a lot of times. And so well, in, in addition to steam humidifiers, um, are there a lot of other IAQ products that you guys are offering that you see customers like have demand for like the UV products or anything that are air filters? Yeah. Air purifiers that utilize UV is a big one. That's something that we're deploying pretty much on every install that, that we're completing. And a lot of that boils down to, you know, a lot of the equipment that we work with has the prime breeding grounds for bacterial growth and things like that. And so the best way to take care of it is using the world's best sanitizer, which is the sun, right? So we can contain that in these ultraviolet lights that can work with carbon grids to help reduce odors, as well as kill any microbes that would be found locally at the evaporator coil or within the air handling system. And that's a good way to keep the equipment clean, keep your air clean, uh, keep everything fresh. And of course, I mentioned the odors, you know, you can keep odors down and uh, so ultraviolet lights would be a very popular IAQ product in our in our region. Right on. And as far as I love the filter debate, we can always get into it with filters because people <laughs> have asked me out here, you know, we show up and we'll see the classic case of like the one inch high Merv filter. Someone throws it in and then it trips, you know, on a furnace, it'll trip their system on high limit um, or cause system icing in the summer. And they'll always ask me like, wh well, why do they sell these then? And I honestly don't know because we don't get air, you know, the best airflow out of them. We're at altitude, so it's a little different. Air is already thinner here. And I think that maybe makes it worse. But what, curious, what's your opinion on some of like the higher MERV rated filters? Are you guys putting in like the four inch uh, filter boxes or any of the, the high flow filters or what do you recommend? We do, we do, yeah. I'm firm believer um, in media filtration. I'm not a big believer in electronic air cleaning as we know with all the data that we have available to us. If you don't maintain those properly, which most homeowners are not giving it the time that it really needs, you're gonna have a significant reduction in its effectiveness. So going with the non-electronic media filter is by far and away a good way to go. Now, the MERV scale, which measures uh, filtration efficiency, tells us the MERV 16 being the highest level is gonna provide the most efficiency. However, you can get MERV 16 filters that are non-electronic, but you're gonna have a significant restriction of airflow like you just mentioned. So one of the ways to avoid that is by using a MERV 13 filter, and that MERV 13 filter is going to allow for air to pass through it sufficiently so we don't have restrictions causing equipment to ice up or uh, limits to trip or anything like that. But it's also going to provide the capture and kill filtration technology. So there are viruses in the air to get trapped in that, that in that fabric and that material and be killed and then stored there until it's dis discarded. So it provides good airflow while providing a top level of filtration as well. And we put those on every system we install as well. And, and the MERV 13, which you're talking about the one inch or you do a, you do a larger system? The... Yeah, it's four inch wide. Um, okay. And, and we tend to lean more towards the April Air product. Uh, I hope it's okay to speak about OEMs. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. April Air makes a fantastic MERV 13 cabinet. It's a very, it's, it's pretty much airtight with the way that their slide rail system works and you just slide the accordion filter onto the rail system, it forces 99% of that air to pass through the filtration with very little leakage on the sides. Right on. Yeah, no, we've done, um, you know, static 
uh, pressure checks, um, you know, with like a four, it was, it wasn't until I was kind of a couple years into HVAC that, it, cause I always thought, you know, the thicker filters would cause more restriction. Cause it's just, it's a bigger filter. Why wouldn't it? But then when you realize that the surface area is massive and it's got those deep pleats that, uh, and I, I hooked it up and I checked, I was like, you know, the static pressure, I think was like a 0.2 or something inches water column, which for reference for uh, any homeowners watching 0. 0.5 is pretty is kind of your sweet spot or what you target. So anything below that means the system is breathing well and has not restrictions and it's uh, your your equipment lasts longer that way, too. Yeah, um, it also surprises homeowners, too, when you tell them it's OK to leave that filter in for six months, because yeah. part of what makes it more efficient is it getting a little bit dirtier. So it's a uh, it's a unique uh, a unique experience when you see them. They're a little little like, oh wait, you just leave it in? Yeah, you leave it in. Don't worry, it's gonna be okay. There's a lot of surface media there to, to yeah. capture that dust. So yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's one of my yeah. I change mine once a year because we don't we don't really use AC up here that much, so we definitely don't need it. And uh, yeah, it works great. So cool. What would you say to a, a customer that's kind of on the fence? on the heating versus you know furnace debate like if they're if they're in the market for system replacement and they're thinking okay do i get a heat pump do i get a furnace you know what would be the considerations that you would talk someone through if they had questions and were trying to make a decision on what's going to make the most sense for them yeah that's a great question so i mean look it first starts with what's already in the house if there's something there if not we've got free reign to discuss what's going to be the best solution for them based on how long they're planning on being in the house, what future you know things do they want to do with the house, add an addition, something like that. But if we're talking just about retrofit, which is just replacing equipment that's pre-existing, um, first thing is to understand what's there and what would be the cost benefit of converting to something different. You know, going from a gas system to an all electric heat pump system is going to it's going to carry some cost with it. I mean, you have to modify ductwork to be able to adapt the new air handling unit in lieu of a furnace. But you've also got to um, update the electrical circuitry as well. And if you've got to go through finished areas, you're going to have some drywall that's going to need to be repaired after the fact, probably with some painting as well. Uh, if you're running through unfinished areas, hey, great, you've got a, a, an easy run, but you still got to pay for the copper wire and, and all that stuff. So it's, there's costs associated with all of it. Um, sitting down, talking with clients about, you know, what is your near-term goal? What's your long-term goal? You know, probably the best, the best question I can ask is, how long are you planning on being in the house? You know, if someone's not planning to have much longevity in the house, the investment may not be worth their while to go through a, a, co a complete conversion like that. So let's talk as if uh, you're my client and you've got a gas system in the house and you're considering an all electric setup. However, you're only planning on being in the home for maybe five or six more years. I would encourage you to steer away from that. That investment cost is not gonna, you're not gonna see a return on that investment in that five to six year period. What you could do, though, is deploy a dual fuel setup, which is, you know, I talked about that earlier. I've got the same situation here in my house. You can still get the functionality of the heat pump system, but instead of electrical uh, resistive heat being your backup, you would go back to your natural gas setup or, in my case, propane. The good thing about utilizing a dual fuel application, particularly with these higher efficiency inverter heat pumps that exist, is the reliance on that backup heat is negligible. I mean, it's almost never going to turn on. And so, so if you're, if you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, but you don't want to have a huge upfront expense, you do a dual fuel application, go with a high efficiency furnace, something that's 96 or 97% efficient. Um, so in the few times of its operational life that it actually does kick on, you're going to be super efficient with how it actually burns that gas. And so that, that would be some of the things that I would want to discuss with my clients to really discern what's going to be the right choice for them. Okay, cool. And then as far as, um, you know, on that note, like the, the comfort factors in terms of the difference between heat pumps versus furnaces, uh, do you feel like heat pumps are more comfortable or furnaces or, or which one kind of do you think is more of an upgrade from a comfort perspective? Another great question. Very loaded as well. I could answer that a, a multitude sure. of ways. <laughs> you know, heat pumps have come a long way. They really, really have come a long way. I mean, the heat pumps of old that would just turn on at one fixed speed were very drafty and made people feel very uncomfortable, typically walking around with a hoodie or something on in the wintertime. But with where we're at now technology-wise and with how effective the performance of these new heat pumps are, and I don't even want to call it new because they've been around for a while, um, but we're just at a different place now. Fortunately, technology has finally gotten into the HVAC uh, space 
And with what we're seeing, you can get 115 to 120 degree air coming out of your vents using an inverter driven heat pump. So the comparative between that and a gas furnace where you're gonna typically see 120 to 125 degree air coming out of the vents uh, is they're pretty much in line with each other. So I don't think you could really miss the mark. You know, it's just, do you wanna save money on gas, burn less gas? What is your gas cost? like? For me with propane, propane is incredibly expensive. Yeah, 100%. Um, you get up to, you know, $4 a gallon. So the, you really want to cut that out. And for me, going dual fuel was a no-brainer. Uh, I did a Platinum 20 inverter-driven heat pump from American Standard with a 96% S-series furnace that they offer. Um, my efficiency is through the roof. I was able to drastically decrease my electric bill for the summer months uh, with cooling. Uh, but then also with the, with the wintertime, I've only had to have my propane tank filled once every 15 months where the previous owner of the home was having it filled up three times a year. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's saving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's probably what, two grand to fill up your tank or, or 1500 bucks. I mean, it's not yeah, round about. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I would avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No. Yes. And as far as like one thing we've heard from customers out here, I don't know if you have the same experience is that we've uh, heat pump heat tends to not be as dry as a furnace because the, the heat from the heat exchanger itself is because it's so hot on the heat exchanger, it tends to dry out the air and increases like static electricity and things like that. Like when we got the humidifier at our house, my wife was like, how do we fix this? I was like, babe, we'll put in a humidifier. We'll do it the spring relax. And cause we had to put in duct work in the whole nine. And she was like, oh my gosh, it's so nice. Not like shocking myself on the lights every time I try yeah. to turn on a light switch. But do you feel the same way where, or do you get that kind of feedback from customers that they think heat pump heat is less dry? It is less dry, definitely. Um, noticeably um, different. Unfortunately, though, in our market, because it does get so dry outside, even if you've got a heat pump system, you should still deploy a, a humidifier because it's just every time you open the door to enter or exit your home, the humidity is going to go flying out and, and it's going to get drier in the home. So yeah. Right. So we hope you found this content helpful. And for more information on how you can connect with Dario, if you happen to be in the DMV area, there'll be a link in the description. And if you're outside of that area and you want to be connected with a contractor, we actually created the HVACDopeShow.com, which is a referral source where you can go ahead and find a contractor in your area. If you submit your information, we handpick a contractor in your area. Now this is in beta mode and this is a soft launch. So we don't have contractors readily available in every area. So when you submit that form, just keep in mind, it may take us a little while to get back to you with a contractor but if you found this content helpful and you'd like to be connected with a contractor like dario please click that link in the description as well and as promised earlier popping up on the screen right now is a link to the full-length interview so check that out if you haven't done so already and we'll catch you on the next episode